Hello, and welcome to The Scriptures Are Real. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that help them become more real to us so that we can draw more power out of them because we need all the help we can get. I'm your host, Kerry Mulstein, and I'm so happy to have with me a returning guest that our uh, long-term audience will be familiar with, uh, Dr. Joshua Matson. We, we call him Josh, uh, who has his uh, PhD from uh, Florida State University in religion, he, but he studied in, uh, in Jerusalem and... Uh, at Trinity Western and all sorts of places. He's a specialist in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the uh, the Minor Prophets of the Old Testament, but just the Old Testament in general. Really, he's a specialist in just about everything. And, and of course, he applies all of that to the Book of Mormon and is uh, so good at the Book of Mormon. He's taught seminary, and now he teaches in the same department I teach in. And he's just a good guy with a good little family. And so welcome, Josh. Good good to have you with us. Well, Kerry, great to be back, and thanks for the compliment. The The good family rubs off on me, so yeah, they're the well, ones that make it good. <laughs> we need that, don't we? Absolutely. Now, for our sponsor for this week, I don't know if you're aware that depression is actually a, a normal mood state. It's something we all go through. We have times in our lives where we have an emotional crisis or something tough that happens. That happens to everyone, but what some people call a disease uh, is is the technical term is major depressive disorder. This is something I've been uh, sensitive to, uh, at not having struggled with it myself, but having had dear friends and loved ones that have struggled with this. Uh, I even gave a speech about this uh, in a speech contest when I was uh, in college. Uh, I think this is something we really need to help people with. So if this is something you struggle with or someone you know struggles with, we need to help. We need to reach out and find ways to help. And there are ways to help. Uh, th this kind of major depressive disorder is different than the normal ups and downs, but it makes it hard to to even function sometimes. So what do you do when you know someone who's uh, showing this, either yourself or someone else? Well, you can get five free tips to help someone naturally alleviate depression. So for those, please email depression at happierhormones.com. That's depression at happierhormones.com. And along with these practical approaches for assisting people that experience depressive systems or symptoms, uh, you can also learn uh, my three favorite supplements that ease depression. Again, that's uh, something that has uh, we've seen made a difference in people that we know and love, including family members and friends. We've seen this. It's a real thing. So for that, you can email depression at happierhormones.com. And then with the, the discount code TSAR, uh, you can get 20% off. If you act this week, the week of this podcast, uh, April 14th through 20th, you email depression at happierhormones.com and use the discount code TSAR for the scriptures are real. You can get 20% off, but you need to act on it this week. So again, if you want uh, tips or natural supplements that really make a difference, it's designed to help your body do what it was programmed to do. And sometimes we just don't give it what it needs to do it. For anything along those lines, email depression at happierhormones.com this week with uh, to get the 20% off code. We are so glad to be able to, to jump in with you, Josh, and talk about uh, these, uh, you might call them the minor books of the uh, Book of Mormon. Uh, there are some pretty uh, small ones in here, but just such rich, wonderful stuff. So I'm hoping you wouldn't mind uh, just jumping in and, and taking us to some of the places you'd like to talk about in these texts. Yeah, Carrie, thank you so much. And and I love these texts. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I studied uh, the minor prophets with my um, education at Florida State and others. And so maybe my thing is I just have a propensity for minor things um, <laughs> that we've got these minor writings and, and I love them. I recently was teaching my class here at BYU and I, I told the students we were going to take a day on each of these books and you could see their eyes just glaze over and thinking, can we really get that much? out of these books. Uh, uh, and, and I, I'm really one, and maybe this is, is just a, a disclaimer at the beginning. I'm one who thinks that if we'd slow down, we sometimes get so excited about being able to read an entire book in one sitting that we rush through uh, these books of Enos, Jerem, Omni, and Words of Mormon. And uh, one of the things I've been trying to encourage my students and others that I talk to is with these chapters, let's slow down. Let's look and let's try and find some connections um, and that's really kind of an overarching theme of what I would like us to discuss today is where are some of these places where we can slow down and see some really cool insights that may be helpful for us? That's fantastic. I, I know one of the things that uh, President Oaks has been teaching for a long time now is that it's it's a good idea to slow down to get good quality rather than quantity. And 
and really get something out of the scriptures. And hopefully then as we do that, maybe we can teach some uh, kind of scripture study skills or hints along the way. But I'm going to say that one of our first scripture study skills we're going to say is slow it down. Now, that's hard because with Come, Follow Me, we try to keep up. Uh, but just uh, at least for something in your reading, slow down and really get into each little element of it. Yeah. And and maybe let's demonstrate that by bridging our readings from last week in the book of Jacob with the book of Enos. So uh, for those, and I, I don't know if your discussion on Jacob covered this, but um, in Jacob chapter six, we actually get Jacob saying, I'm done. He, yeah. he finishes his commentary on the allegory of the olive tree and he says, amen. And if, if, if Jacob maybe had his way, that's where he was going to end it. And then in Jacob chapter seven, he goes, now many years have passed <laughs> and there came this man and I have to tell you this story. Right. And so chapter seven is not written at the same time as the rest of Jacob's text, um, but it's kind of an add on. And if we only had that last part of Jacob six, then uh, one, we'd miss out on that great story with Sharon. But we'd also not really have an idea of how the plates were going to be passed on. And so at the end of of chapter seven, Jacob gives a charge to his son Enos in which he gives him the plates and says something very similar to what he was told by Nephi uh, when he received the plates. But again, coming back to our our kind of slowing down, we, we read this in verse 27 of Jacob seven. And I, Jacob, saw that I must soon go down to my grave. Wherefore, I said unto my son Enos, take these plates. And I told him the things which my brother Nephi had commanded me. So we read that. We rush through the end of, of chapter or of verse 27. And then we look at the very next book and we see that it's named the book of Enos. And we go, OK, this is the passing on. However, when we look at the time frame that's covered in the book of Enos, we're actually covering from about 545 B.C. to 420 B.C. Now, I don't want to discount the idea that Enos may have been a, a long liver, um, you know, 125 years um, and have a long life. But when we slow down, look at verse one in Enos. So the book of Enos, verse one, behold, it came to pass that I, Enos, knowing my father, that he was a just man. Now, the assumption that we make is, is that father is Jacob. However, nowhere in the rest of this introduction does Enos ever refer to what the name of his father was. Hmm. And in the Book of Mormon, we never have anybody who names their child after themselves. And so maybe it's a, a standoff. I'm, I'm saying that jokingly. Right. We right. have so many examples of multiple Mosiahs, multiple Nephi's, multiple Almas. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if maybe there may even be a gap here. And that Enos, the son of Jacob, isn't necessarily the Enos of the book of Enos. We don't have any internal evidence that suggests that. Interesting. I never even noticed that before, but you're right. So we'd have to look at all the the years that they give us, but we, we have them fairly well summarized for us. And uh, I'd never noticed that you have this huge gap. That's interesting. And so, again, I don't want to discount the idea that this may actually be um, Enos, the son of Jacob. But Enos never says that in the text, and it may help explain why Enos is going through this wrestle at the beginning of his book. He was taught righteousness. He was taught to do right things. Uh, we're going to see that in detail from how he talks about thinking upon what his father taught concerning um, the, the coming of the Lord, and that he was oftentimes taught about the, the things that he needed to do to receive a remission of his sins. Um but I, I love the idea of thinking that, hey, maybe this is not just a direct connection uh, to, to the Jacob that we've just come to love and, and study in ex uh, to study extensively through Second Nephi and Jacob. Uh, that's, a, that's wonderful. I, I also want to highlight this uh, line where he says, he taught me in his language and also in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I suspect we're going to spend a little time on the effects of that admonition, but uh, one of the things Noel Reynolds early on got us kind of started on this idea of, of keeping track of the fact that uh, the brass plates, at least uh, you have to know Egyptian to read those. And that's a language that gets carefully passed on through the record keepers 
uh, so that they can both read those things and end up, uh, at least in the case of Mormon and Moroni, writing and some uh, something influenced by that. Uh, so we're, we want to just kind of keep a little eye. We don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but keep a little eye on that, that here we see that it's not just the, the uh, teachings of Christ, although that's the most important part, but we have this other teaching that's being passed on by these record keepers. Yeah, and and Carrie, this is a point that I'm really uh, excited about. Uh, I recently uh, published a, an article, a chapter in a book uh, about this idea of parenting in the Book of Mormon mm. and what do you teach to your children. And so you, you've brought up this idea of teaching language um, in that article when I talk about Enos. And, and I actually side on, on the, the idea that if we're talking about Jacob being the father of Enos, then we can make some more of these connections through what Enos is going to be taught. Um, but regardless, the teachings are still there. Um, but um, it made me ask this question. And, and the question stems from Proverb 22, 6, that almost all of us at one time or another in our life have have committed to memory. Uh, but here in the Proverbs, we read, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that we sometimes approach that in kind of a Pollyannish way, that if I teach my children about the gospel, then there's a hundred percent guarantee that they won't stray from the gospel. And um, in, in this article that I was just talking about, one of the things that I tried to emphasize is that the Book of Mormon actually kind of teaches against that Pollyannish view. Think of Lehi and Sariah. Think of Alma the Elder and Alma the Younger. Um, even here, Enos talks about all these things that he was um, that he was taught by his father, but he is seeking God in mighty prayer for a remission of his sins. He recognizes that in his life he's strayed, and all of us, to some extent, will always sin and we will stray. Um, but I, I wonder, and the Book of Mormon seems to teach. That that proverb, when we read, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The it isn't referencing in my reading, because it's ambiguous in the Hebrew, but the it isn't talking about the way that we should go. But what if the it is the teachings or the training that the child receives? Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be manifest here, because what is it that Enos is reflecting on? He's reflecting on the training that he received from his father. That's right. Um, I, I agree. Um, and and to continue in this this same vein, if we actually flip over to the book of Omni for a minute, um, Omni is one of these these great characters in the Book of Mormon because he gets the plates and he records, "I of myself am a wicked man." Right. Uh, and, 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 and I never so, know what to make of that, uh, to, to be honest, because uh, Nephi called himself a wicked man. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. And 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 that's the idea. Um, and he goes, and I have not kept the statutes and the commandments of the Lord as I ought to have done. Um, and so he, he sits there and he goes, I didn't quite live up to my potential. Mm -hmm. But again, looking at that same parallel of the training, look at what he says. Uh, at the very beginning of, of Omni 1.1, 1, 1, behold, it came to pass that I, Omni, being commanded by my father, Jerem, that I should write somewhat upon these plates to preserve our genealogy. And so what is the thing that Omni, who himself says, I'm wicked and I didn't keep the commandments, but what I am going to keep is the teaching that I received from my father. Yeah. yeah. And so he he didn't necessarily stay on the path. But he didn't stray from the teachings that he had received from his parents. And I, I, I just really feel that sometimes as a parent myself, I can get really caught up in the idea of if my child makes a mistake or chooses to do something against what I've taught them, did I fail as a parent? Yeah. And, and I take comfort in the Book of Mormon and these examples that... I can I can train my children and they have the agency to make their own choices, but God is making me a promise they won't forget what I taught them, and they're going to use their agency to either follow it or to go away from it. Very good. And I, and I think that the Book of Mormon, and, and we're about to hit Enos, which is one of those great examples, but it's full of a lot of great examples of uh, the, the teachings of a parent coming at the right time, not having saved from all sin, not having saved them from straying and doing stupid things, but when they needed it, 
that teaching was there and the spirit could use it because it, it had something to bring to their remembrance. Yeah. And I'm glad that you highlighted that exact phrase, right? That's one of the things the spirit does uh, in our tradition. We don't believe in ex nihilo creation. I love president Holland's words that for those who are getting ready to take a test, it's kind of in vain to try and ask for ex nihilo creation in memory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we have to put something there for our children to know. And that's where I, I feel the book of Mormon is very clear that parents responsibility is to teach not to ensure that their children do the things, but that they've been taught the things so that they can use their agency uh, to be able to make correct choices. And then we can trust in God. We can let God prevail in the lives of our children by saying, we did everything in our power. Now we're handing it over to you. Yeah. And sometimes that's all you can do, right? You still love, you still accept, but sometimes all you're doing is praying and, uh, and you wait for the miracles and they come in God's timing. I think most of the time they come. But uh, you have to wait for that timing. Yeah. And and I think on a, a macro level, we actually see this in um, these minor books, because most of these books, when we look at who the audience is, the audience is the Lamanites. Mm -hmm. These authors are not writing to their Nephi contemporaries. They're writing to the future. And they know from the prophecies that the Nephite civilization is going to become annihilated. And so yeah. they're writing to their brethren, the Lamanites. And I think that's another great way of being able to see this is that they are so concerned about how future generations can be impacted by their words. Uh, very good. And hopefully we have that uh, that long uh, view in mind, that long game view in mind as well. So good. And and so I, I love that. I know we we often talk about Enos, but these are some of the topics that I've noticed we don't necessarily always dig into when we're talking about Enos's story. Um, uh, again, slowing down and looking at those first couple of verses uh, to be able to help us see what um, is going to come later. Very good. Yeah, and and I think these few verses are are so powerful in. Uh, uh, we we often focus on the second part of the story, but this first part of the story is uh, is what makes the second part. Yeah, and so so going to verse three again, continuing on this in, well, in the book. If it's all right, maybe I'd just like to say just another little thing about verse two, and yeah, and I may have an opposing view or a different view than you or most people who do this, but he talks about that that wrestle, and I'll I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, again, I'm not sure. Well, I often hear people say, okay, so he was a pretty big sinner. I mean, I, I just don't know that we can tell. Uh, certainly, if he's anything like either his uh, uncle or great uncle or great, great uncle Nephi, uh, who Nephi himself, w when he was incredibly righteous, was talking about wrestling with God for a remission of his sins and so on. Uh, so I don't know where he is on that scale. But to me, that's part of the lesson. It's actually irrelevant. It's 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 fully irrelevant. I mean, it's relevant in a way that we need to all know, as you said. Yeah, we have people that make mistakes that come back, but in some ways, it's irrelevant. Everyone is somewhere on the sinner scale, and uh, we're we're all and there's not really a lot of difference in some ways between where where one person is and the other. And of course, in some ways, there are like some sin is really uh, dealing a lot of damage to other people and to ourselves, and harder to repent from, and so on and so on. But but it's all somewhere on the sin scale, and we all need to come to that realization, wow, I need a remission of my sins. And uh, I think of when President Nelson talked about uh, we should all repent daily, and then President Eyring said he spent that night uh, repenting and uh, and really uh, working through this. And you think, I mean, this guy who's been in the first presidency a long time at that point, he's a pretty, he's a pretty good guy. I think we all sense what a good guy he is. And yet he is, I think, having an experience, you know, where he feels convicted of his sins and he's seeking for a remission of his sins. So we're all somewhere on that scale. And I love to see someone who uh, I he doesn't say it this way, but I can almost put Joseph Smith's words in there. I, he was convicted of his sins. Therefore, he wrestled with God uh, and then he receives this remission of his sins. I think Joseph Smith could talk, uh, could phrase it in the same way. I had a wrestle with God and Satan. Um, but a wrestle with God uh, before he received the remission of his sins. And so uh, I, I hope that 
it, rather than saying, okay, Enos is this kind of a person and that's not like me, so this doesn't apply to me, we can say, we don't know where Enos is, but he's somewhere on this, uh, this uh, spectrum and I'm on that as well. And let's learn from him, regardless of where he is and where I am, the principles still apply to me. 100%. And, and as you were speaking, I couldn't help but think of Paul's words to the Romans, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter the, the smallest or the largest. Uh, and I love that connection with the prophet Joseph Smith. One study I did once was how many times Joseph Smith was told that his sins were forgiven him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you get it in the first vision. And then Joseph in 1823, when he's praying before the, the angel Moroni appears, he, again, he's seeking to know, am I forgiven of the things that I've done in the interim yeah. from the first vision till now? And then uh, Joseph Smith, multiple times in the future, in Kirtland, in Nauvoo, um, in section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, this same promise keeps coming. And, and it ties perfectly to what President Nelson is saying, that we need to repent daily. And I think the scriptures are very evident that God will remit our sins daily if we will repent daily. Amen. Amen. I love it. Uh, and so, again, one of the ways that we can see that that remission of sins moving into verse three is that Enos sets the stage by saying, I went to hunt beasts in the forest uh, and the words which I had often heard my father speak concerning eternal life and the joy of the saints sunk deep into my heart. Um, so it's it's those teachings again. Uh, again, it's anonymous who his father is, um, but he's saying my father taught me and the things that he taught me sunk in. And I think that that's even as, as a parent and as I think of whatever choices my children might make or others in, in my life make, isn't that really the prayer that I should be praying? Instead of saying, Heavenly Father, please force this person to do the things that I want them to do. Maybe we should be praying, please let the things that we've taught them or the things that they know stink deep and help them to remember. That's what Alma's going to say later when he's instructing his his sons. He says that when I was in that state of comatose, what did I remember? I remembered the things that my father had taught me. And so maybe that's even a, a great lesson here is that we should pray more earnestly for those who may be wandering or, or may have forgotten this, that they can remember what it feels like to know the words of eternal life that they've been taught. So powerful. In fact, I have said this a number of times, probably even already on this podcast, I can't remember, but in my mind, I'm, I'm, 100% sure I'm right on the first two. I haven't done the numeric analysis to be sure I'm right on the third one, but I'm I'm pretty confident. I, I think if you're just to say numerically, the, to the amount of times the topic is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, first one is Christ and his atoning sacrifice. Second one is Israel, the role of the House of Israel, covenants and gathering of Israel. The third one, I think, is remembering. It's it's this call to remember. And I would count something like this as part of that, right? That he remembers the, the words. It doesn't use the word, but that's what he's doing is remembering the words of his parents. And uh, and it does make me think, I, I heard someone say once, and I really resonate with this, speaking of their children, uh, they'd say, you know, uh, it, free agency is great until it's not. <laughs> and yeah. um, uh, But in the end, it's still great, right? And, and what you said is exactly right. It's not forcing them, uh, making them, do good. That's Satan's plan. That's not going to work. What we need is for them, even if they lose that desire to at some point remember, and then yeah. they start to make the choices of their own volition. Then we get Alma the Younger, we get Shiblon uh, and Corianton, I guess it's really Corianton we get there. And But anyway, we get these people who end up doing really well because they remembered. Yeah. I, I, I just have to put this plug in. I, I recently went to a missionary farewell for one of my students, not a farewell. We don't call him that anymore, but he was speaking yeah. on his, uh, on, on his way out. So uh, the, uh, the, the practice the, the formerly fallback. known as a farewell. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, this missionary was speaking and I was so pr impressed by the fact that he felt inspired to speak about agency. Mm -hmm. uh, of all the topics that he could have spoken on as he's leaving to go on a mission, he said, I'm, I'm so grateful for the blessing of agency and that what my opportunity is as a missionary is to go and help people exercise their agency to come closer to God. That's what my purpose is. Uh, and I thought that was so profound coming from an individual who's setting out on their two-year mission. Uh, very good. And right, maybe if it's all right, I'd just also like to touch on the the topics that really got him were 
eternal life and it's accompanying joy, the joy that could come yeah. with eternal life. But even the joy of the saints in this life is what it seems like he's saying. He is thinking about what brings joy and yeah. that's what he wants. And that's what makes it so that, that you get that next line, right? I, I love the fr the phrases. So he, he remembers what his father taught about eternal life and the joy of the saints. And those things sunk deep into his heart. So they were already deep in his heart or he wouldn't remember them, but they sink even deeper and then the next line, and my soul hungered, right? He wants that when when that starts to when he starts to really think about it, his soul hungers for it. Now we may need uh, we may need to get more of our uh, kids and grandkids and so on in places where it's like this. He's out away from hustle and bustle. He doesn't have ear pods in. And he has to stop and think. And that may be part of the problems we're encountering is that people don't have to stop and think very often these days. Uh, they can distract themselves to where they never think. But if, but everyone sooner or later is going to be faced with a situation that forces them to stop and think. And let's hope that they can remember these things that we've taught them, that they will want joy, that will sink deep in their heart, and that will cause them to hunger. Yeah. And, and President Nelson's challenge uh, uh, a few years back and, and uh, to the mission presidents at the mission president seminar, where he said, you need to make sure that your missionaries recognize what it means to pray in a closet. Hmm. What does it mean to separate ourselves from the world to, in a way, really confine ourselves to just being with God? Yeah. Um, and, and, and Enos, this story gets set up that way by saying he goes into the forest. How many times in scripture do people go into the wilderness? So we have forest here, but in other scriptures, we have people go into the wilderness, the savior being the greatest example of going into the wilderness for 40 days to be with God as the Joseph Smith translation emphasizes. Um, and, and I, I'm always struck by the connection between the word for wilderness in Hebrew midbar. Mm -hmm. with the word deber, which means the word yeah. um, in, in Hebrew. And so it's almost this idea that being isolated, the only thing you have to take with you is the word that, as Enos is saying, sunk deep into my soul. Good. And if, let's let's play with that connection just a little bit more. They eventually will take that word for, uh, for word, deber, and it becomes the word for the Holy of Holies, where you can experience the presence of God. And I don't think that any of that is disconnected because it's so often, I mean, in fact, Israel's original temple was Mount Sinai in the wilderness where they experienced the presence of God. There's, there's not a disconnect between these things. There is a connect. Yeah. And, and uh, I know it's a change in language, but then when we go to the new Testament and this, this very rich word of logos that is presented mm -hmm. in John chapter one, right in the beginning was the word. Yeah. Um, and, it's a change in language, and, but just the way we get it, not in the way that John is thinking it. He, he's a native yep. uh, speaker, right? Uh, 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 Aramaic, probably speaker, but uh, I think he's thinking of that word. Yeah. And so, so why do we go just like the Savior? We go into the wilderness to be with God. Uh, we go and separate ourselves. And I'm as guilty as anyone. Uh, ask my wife. I am one who tries to fill every minute of every day with something. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, just being, just being honest and vulnerable. Like I struggle with stillness. Yeah. Uh, that that challenge from president Nelson has been a hard one. Um, I have seen benefits, but I could do better. Uh, I yeah. I'm not perfect at it. And, and this conversation is motivating me to want to do that a little bit more. Me as well. I mean, I'll, I'll confess as well. Like I I'm someone, I'm so hungry for knowledge that I'm, I'm constantly, I've got a podcast on or I'm listening to scriptures or something. I've always got something. If I have a, a chance to listen and do something, I'm listening and do something. So I've had to consciously make the decision. These activities, I'm just going to think. So like one is mowing the lawn uh, and I have like way too big a lawn. So it takes me a long time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, usually about 45 minutes of just thinking. And I actually have great experiences doing that. And some other activities where I'm going to work or, you know, something where I'm walking. So my body's busy and that actually physiologically, there are some kinds of thinking that is aided if we have kinetic movement as well, right? So there's some times where I just sit and listen, but there's other thinking that happens better when you're moving. So I have to set aside certain times and certain activities where this is where I'm going to unplug and think, because if not, by default, I'll never do it. Yeah. And and Carrie, I think your example is so perfect, is that we have to be intentional. We It will not happen if we just say, oh, I, it, when the time comes, we'll be good. 
Uh, I'll give that time to God. We have to be intentional and we have to say, this is the time. This is the time I'm going to separate myself from the world. And that's what President Nelson has used. I, I, I don't know if there's a prophet in the modern latter days who has used the word intentional more than President Nelson has. Uh, but he, <laughs> he's, he's intentionally he talks about, used it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that we need to be intentional. Uh, we need to be intentional with our temple worship. We need to be intentional with our scripture study. We need to be intentional with silence and stillness. Um, we need to be intentional in prayer. Uh, we have to be agents who act rather than objects that are being acted upon. Amen. Amen. We could talk about this topic actually for a long, long time. There's lots more I'm thinking <laughs> of, but I don't want to beat it to death. Yeah. But I, I, I think, uh, yeah, again, going back to President Nelson, if we want to hear him, we really are going to have to make some time to hear him. Uh, it's not going to happen without that intentional effort. So uh, figure out the way it works for you, but but make it happen and then make it happen some more and then some more. Driving is another time that can be good. I, turn, I used to listen to everything I could while I was driving. Now I, I set aside time to pray and think uh, more and so on. I'm not perfect at it, but I, I, we all need to get better. Yeah. I, I, I Amen. Again, because we're all sinners and we all fall short. So uh, I love that that kind of theme. Um, so Carrie, uh, my intention here, uh, a lot of this, uh, I don't want to miss verse eight. And then I think we can move on to some of these other minor books. Uh, but in verse eight, when the Lord speaks to Enos, he, he emphasizes that this is all possible, not because of the teachings, not because of the church, not even because of the covenant, but because of thy faith in Christ, mm -hmm. whom thou hast never before heard nor seen. So one of the things that verse eight always impresses upon me is Enos is our first author who didn't know the old world. Yeah. Every other author in the book of Mormon before this knew the ancient world. Jacob was born in the wilderness, but he was still there and was a direct uh, interact in, interacted directly with Lehi and Nephi who were familiar with the, the ancient world um, or the old world um, in what we would call the, the Middle East today. But um, Enos is our first person who's detached from that. And remember in second Nephi chapter 11, when Nephi is getting ready to introduce Isaiah and he says, I'm going to, uh, of course you do. You're the Isaiah, one of the Isaiah experts in the world. And so I know, you know, this part, but I love that Nephi says, I'm going to quote the words of Isaiah because Isaiah has seen my redeemer. Mm -hmm. And I've written the words of Jacob because Jacob has seen my redeemer and I have seen my redeemer. But now we're getting a complete opposite with Enos because the Lord himself is saying, you have never seen or heard from him. And I, I think that this is a comforting fact for people like myself who say, I love hearing about the witnesses of others, but what about me? What about me who I haven't had that visionary experience or I haven't had that direct experience? I haven't heard the voice of the Lord. Um, Enos is someone that I can resonate with because I can hear the words of others and I can be uplifted and being drawn closer to the Savior. And it's the promise that eventually, whether in this life or the next, I will have that opportunity to be able to see him manifest as the rest of verse eight. And Enos says, and many years pass away before he shall manifest himself in the flesh. Wherefore go to thy faith hath made thee whole. Uh, beautiful. And, and maybe I'll just highlight um, because we've been kind of asked to highlight scripture study skills. You've just uh, illustrated one that I'd love for my audience to pay attention to. And that's to look for the causative words. And I think I've said this before, but let's bring it up again here. Verse eight, when, and when we get Christ himself or God, the Lord himself saying why he's done something, pay attention. So if he says, because then stop and pay attention. How is it that he's, he's forgiven because of faith in Christ, as you highlighted. And so I just want to highlight that skill along with the lessons you drew from it. Yeah. Well, and and I love that idea, right? Is this is the doing. When I do my scripture study, when I find words that are do's, I have a specific color, whether it's my digital or my my physical scriptures, I, I highlight the do's. And mm. here, right, it's it's the faith in Christ. That's the do. And what is going to come about of this? My guilt can be swept away. Mm -hmm. If we go back to verse six. 
Yep. Which is the the effect that's going to come from that cause. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So good. Um, so uh, Enos, a, a wonderful book, uh, is going to pass on. And then we get these, um, we get to the book of Jerem. Uh, like I said, I kind of want to highlight just a couple of things from each of these books that we can slow down a little bit. Um, but Jerem, I, I, I love his honesty. Um, in uh, Jerem verse 2, uh, he says, I've received these uh, from my father Enos. Again, this is why I'm so big on that idea of Enos maybe not being the son of Jacob, is these other authors are very explicit in saying, I am Jerem, the son of Enos, my yeah. father Enos. Um, but I, I love what he says. He receives them and he goes, I'm going to write just a little bit. But I shall not write the things of my prophesying nor my revelations, for what could I write more than my fathers have written? He's yeah. he's very honest in saying, I was told to do my to write my visions and my revelations, but they're nothing compared to what my fathers had. So please go back and study theirs. Yeah. And you and you'll see uh it, it, one of the other us is also telling you plus we're running out of room on the plates. So uh yeah. I, I think that's a real thing. Like, okay, I'm I'm he's humble enough to recognize. Uh, he doesn't really have anything different to add from what Jacob and Nephi have said. Uh, they're kind of the, the kings of these plates. And uh, uh, he wants to be obedient, so he's writing something, but he knows he doesn't have room to write much, and he doesn't have uh, something significant, so he's just going to write a little bit. But then he writes some pretty significant stuff, I would say. Yeah, well, starting in verse 5, he starts to talk about what's causing the downfall of the Nephites, mm -hmm. is that the, the civilization of the Nephites in the land of Nephi is starting to become precarious because of the fact that they're prospering. Uh, they're, they're having all of these great things happen for them, and yet that's causing them to deteriorate in their faith. It's causing them to deteriorate in their um, their trust in the Lord because they have everything that they need. Uh, when I when I read these verses, I can't help but hear the words of Brigham Young that when he yeah. said that his greatest worry for the saints was that they were going to prosper, yeah. that they that they could endure persecution and suffering and and all of this turmoil in their lives, but the one thing they couldn't handle was becoming wealthy or becoming well off and that that would be to their downfall. Yeah. In fact, I think one of the word phrases he used when describing that is that they would get fat and kick themselves into hell. Yeah. <laughs> Typical Brigham Young uh, candor, but <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And in fact, maybe yeah. if it's all right, I'd like to, to tie exactly what you're talking about in with a, a verse that I think ties it in with what we were just talking about. So uh, as you said, they're, they're going to get uh, wealthy and that will be some pride. And one of the ways we, uh, the Book of Mormon authors talk about pride is being stiff necked, which means you, you're not bowing your head in humility, right? So now let's go back up to verse four. Um, th there are many among us who have many revelations for they are not all stiff necked. And as many as are not stiff necked and have faith, have communion with the Holy Spirit, which maketh manifest, manifest uh, sorry, which maketh manifest unto the children of men according to their faith. Uh, we could go back up to verse 3. It's expedient that much should be done among this people because of the hardness of their hearts and deafness of their ears, blindness of their minds, and stiffness of their necks. And I, I see some echoes with uh, some things that Enoch says in there as well. But anyway, you see his point. I think he's saying that be the pride is making it so that they don't have communion with God. They don't have the inspiration and revelation from God. And that makes some sense because I will say that when I've had great need is when I pray the most. It's when I seek God the most. It's when I ask the most. And it's when I spend the most time being willing to listen to God because I need to hear something. Right? You have great need and you're going to the temple four times in a week to get an answer or something like that. And things are fine and you're going once or less a month. Right? Uh, um, and you're, so I think that's th these things are combined and incredibly applicable to our day. Uh, when things are going dandy and everything's all right, we're not turning to God and we're not making the time to have that communion come. And that's when we're going to have problems. And President Nelson's been pretty clear. If you're not having regular communion with the Holy Ghost right now, you're not going to survive spiritually in the last days. Yeah. And and to quote President Nelson's wife, Sister Nelson, uh, she gave a devotional to introduce President Nelson to young adults back in 2018. And one of the things that she talked about 
was the idea of desperation. Mm. How desperate are we? Uh, are we desperate for spiritual experiences? That's what I saw in verse four. These individuals who have many revelations and are not stiff necked and have communion with the Holy Spirit, they're desperate for those spiritual experiences. Right. And, and and I think that's how we can develop it is we don't have to let our search situations dictate how desperate we are. We can create intentional time in which we show our desperation to God because we are need we need everything from him. Yeah. In fact, it reminds me of President Benson saying, God will have a humble people. Either we can choose to be humble or we can be compelled to be humble. Then he gave us wise counsel. Let us choose to be humble. And and we think of that, but I don't know how often we think of it as in in these terms that Jerem is making for us. So if you're really humble, you know how much you need communion from God. And so you will be desperately seeking it even when everything is wonderful. Yeah. And, and, and how much more connectiveness could we get with God than if we just had that constant state of dependence Mm -hmm. is that I am dependent upon you for everything. Isn't that what Alma tells us when we pray, right? Pray over your flocks and your fields and all that you have because that's how desperate. Yeah. And, and that, uh, that, that we have so much of that need in our lives. Amen. Beautiful. So good. Well, I, I want to keep with our greatest hits as we're, we're continuing on. Omni is one of my favorite books uh, because it covers uh, 230 years in the space of just a couple of verses. Yeah. yeah um, you have a whole bunch of guys so, who are basically saying, I'm supposed to write and there's like a, a quarter of an inch of space. So let me put some in here. <laughs> yeah. And so they're just throwing out their their ideas. But I just I want the uh our, our audience to just take away the fact that we're covering 230 years here. By comparison, Alma chapter one through Alma chapter 45 only covers 19 years of Nephite history. Yeah. And so as, as we look at this, uh, I think it's important to realize that there's so much that's probably going on, but we need to recognize that the, the history is moving very, very quickly. Um, and, and that we're, we're getting a lot of this, of course, all of this was on the large plates. So there was probably more about what's happening in all of this. Uh, this was part of Moron or Mormon's abridgment that Joseph Smith translated as the 116 page manuscript. Uh, and so much of what we're reading here was probably included in much more detail. And so we can't just say all of this, but I think that gets us to what I want to bridge to our last topic which is what is the purpose of the small plates? The small plates, their intended purpose was to be, uh, as Mormon's going to call them in words of Mormon, the um, a small account of the prophets. That's in words of Mormon, verse three. So like these are prophetic accounts. And if it's any indication, we're, we're seeing that they're running out of space, but they're also maybe having a little less to write about because that civilization the Nephites have gone away from God because of their prosperity that mm. Jerem warned us about in his book. Interesting. That's, that's, that's a powerful observation. I mean, I mean, it's, it's clear that some of them like Jerem could have said more, uh, but it also seems like some of them don't have a lot that they have to say. Yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe that's exemplified. I love Omni 25 and 26, which is this farewell that we get from Amalekai. Um, Amalekai is going to, um, is giving this farewell. Uh, but I, I, I have to, to give, uh, credit to Grant Hardy, who in his work on these verses, he was able to see that Amalekai's farewell in Omni 25 and 26 is a compilation of quotations from Jacob, Enos, Lehi, and Nephi. Mm. Is he takes from their farewells and he puts it together. But I love this note from Grant Hardy. He says, this is similar to what Moroni is going to do when he concludes the large plates. And he uses a similar strategy by bringing in all of these words that have been written over the entirety of the Book of Mormon. Um, and, and so, as I said, I wanted to kind of use this as a, uh, a bridge to our, our kind of last topic, which is what's the function of words of Mormon? Uh, 
is uh, what is Mormon doing? Because he writes these on the small plates. Yeah. Um, so there's at least enough room on the small plates where Mormon's able to say, by the way, I'm just going to put this little note all these years later, yeah. uh, writing probably around 385 AD. Um, and so you're, you're 515 years in the future from when the last person in Omni, when Amalekai is writing. And so there's still enough room on the plates for Mormon to say something. Yeah. And I think that that is profound. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, all right, but we're doing Omni first. Um, I mean, I'm good with that. I'm good with Omni. So we oh, okay. Can, okay. Or, unless Sorry. you want more. No, no, that's fine. Sorry. I misunderstood you. <clears throat> okay. Then no. let's talk about Mormon. Yeah. So words of Mormon is something fascinating because I think, uh, at least in my reading of the text, it appears that Mormon has already started his abridgment of the large plates. Yeah, and and, and my so, reading of it, he may be, be close to finishing it, almost feels like. Yeah. And so Mormon has been abridging this. And at least, if nothing else, I think he has finished the records up to the time that Amalekai gives the plates to King Benjamin. Um, yeah. And so he's covered from 600 B.C., to approximately 150 uh, BC in that general area. Right. Um, well, I mean, if, if you look at verse one, he is about to deliver up his plates to Moroni. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty far into his record when he's getting close to handing it off. Yeah. And so, and, and I don't know if that's when he finds the small plates or that's when he's writing this on the small plates. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, yeah. I don't know either. And, and and this is why uh, I, I see this is that when he when he says in verse three and now I speak somewhat concerning that which I have written, so he says I've already been doing my abridgment, for after I had made an abridgment from the plates of Nephi down to the reign of King Benjamin of whom right. Amalekai spake, so he gets all the way to that point and then he says this I searched among the records which had been delivered into my hands and I found these plates. Yep. I wonder, and this is me totally speculating, and, and I want the audience to forgive me for this, but I wonder if at that point there's actually a reference of the small plates for the first time on the large plates. It, it wouldn't surprise me because it seems like somewhere here there's a decision made, okay, th we can't keep going with these small plates. Let's just turn all of it over to the large plates and uh, and turn it all over to the king's and uh, and have them take care of it. We're kind of done with this thing that we've been doing. And so it wouldn't surprise me if you don't get at that the time that that happens, the kings make a record of it. Now we've taken possession. Now we're we're uh, going to uh, you know just make our only record on these plates and so on. That that, that makes sense to me. Yeah, and and keep in mind, so Malachi is from this prophetic line of the mm -hmm. small plates. King Benjamin is from the kingly line of the large plates right so nephi originally makes both of them and then there seems to be the split between the kingly historical record and the prophetic spiritual record and amalekai seems to suggest here that i'm giving them to king benjamin because he's he's a righteous one who's like nephi who's going to overlap both of these roles right and and there's a genealogical issue king. here as well the kings seem to come, not 100% sure, but seem to come from Nephi. Uh, they're probably all his descendants. I know someone who's made an argument that they're Sam's descendants. I'm not particularly convinced. But anyway, uh, there's nothing that would make us think that they're Jacob's descendants. But this, yeah. this record is actually Jacob's descendants, not Nephi's descendants. And so it's it's not only a prophetic and, and, and royal uh, division, but it's a, it's a descendancy division as well. But as, as we've said, at some point, they just say, well, it's time to merge. Yeah. And, and Amalekai actually will say part of that in saying, I didn't have any children of my own. Yeah. Right. And so that's why I'm giving it to King Benjamin. I don't have someone to give it to. This is in Omni 25, having no seed and knowing King Benjamin to be a just man before the Lord. Right. And and so they come together. But then here's the other part that, that I find fascinating. So Mormon has has abridged the large plates, and, and I like to just use the 116 pages as kind of a, a marker. So he's done this 116-page worth of a manuscript, 
to this point. Mm -hmm. And he finds out about these small plates and he goes and finds them. And then he says this, I searched among the records which had been delivered unto me. And I found these plates, which contained this small account of the prophets from Jacob going to your point. This is Jacob's lineage down to the reign of this King Benjamin. And I also, and also many of the words of Nephi and the things which are upon these plates in verse four, pleasing me because of the prophecies of the coming of Christ. So the first reason is that he loves these plates is they have prophecies about Christ, which again, assumes that they're not on the large plates. And then, and my fathers, so this is referring back to all of these descendants of Nephi, because Mormon's going to make that statement, I'm a direct descendant of Nephi. Mm -hmm. And my fathers, knowing that many of them have been fulfilled, yea, and I also know that as many things as have been prophesied concerning us, the Nephites. So now Mm -hmm. we've got a second topic on the, 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 the small plates which are these things that are um, written about the prophecies of the Nephites and the Lamanites and many things beyond this day, which must surely come to pass. So Mormon pauses and says, wait a second, here's prophecies of Jesus. Here's prophesies of my people. And I've already read the other records and know that these things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And there's other prophecies, which I haven't seen, but I want to include that are going to happen later. And so he says these things. Now, this verse, verse five, when we slow down and we read this, this is why I might suggest that Mormon had only gotten to that part in the small plates and or in the large plates, excuse me, with his his abridgment, because then he says, wherefore, I choose these things to finish my record upon them. And I wonder if Mormon has this ex this this just extreme experience with the small plates and says, I've been doing it wrong for these 116 pages of manuscript. Hmm. I've been recording history. I've been recording things that are of less importance. But now that I've read the small plates, I'm going to change the way that my record looks. I'm going to focus on the fulfillment of prophecies of Christ. I'm going to focus my record on the fulfillment of prophecies concerning the Nephites and the Lamanites. And I'm going to include things that are talking about what is going to happen beyond. And I'm going to show in the rest of my abridgment, the fulfillment of the prophecies that were given on the small plates. Interesting. That's, that's, uh, that's really interesting. So yeah, there's some things we'll have to puzzle together there because one verse makes it sounds like it's towards the end. I would agree that he's finding this at about this point in, in his own abridgment. Uh, and verse five, it says, I chose these things to finish my record upon them. So it sounds like that that makes it sound like it's in the past. But then he says, there in my record, which I shall take from the plates of Nephi, uh, and I cannot write the hundredth part. So that makes it sound like it's in the future. So there's there's an interesting mismatch of evidence here. But uh, one way or the other, whether he's uh, uh, however this is working out, it's clear that these are influencing the way he writes what he's writing. And that he's so moved by them that he's appending them to his own record, right? He's just sticking it yeah. on there, as it were, which ends up being very fortunate for us. But that's that's pretty powerful. Well, and 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 I love that that idea. And again, I uh, either way, whether he's doing this at the end or later, but or, if this is some influencing, of both, who knows? What, yeah. Is he 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 makes this reference? I cannot write the hundredth part of the things of my people. Is almost a direct quotation of Jacob chapter three, yeah. where Jacob in chapter three uses that exact same phrase. And so you see that he's being influenced by by what he's read. Um, but one of the other reasons that I I really like this idea, and again, whether or not um, it's it's a hundred percent true, if Mormon wants to correct me later, I'm a hundred percent okay with that. Um, But going back to to verse seven or going forward to verse seven, he says this. So in verse six, Mm -hmm. he says, I'm going to add these to the end of my record. Um, And so we have to remember the large plates. The abridgment is what's first on the gold plates and then the small plates. And so when Joseph Smith is translating, he translates that 116 pages of Mormon's abridgment from Nephi to King Benjamin. That gets lost. So when he starts translating with Oliver Cowdery, Uh, For what we have, he starts in Mosiah 
and goes forward from Mosiah to the end of the Book of Mormon and then goes back and well, it doesn't go backwards because the plates are the way they are in the uh, the gold plates is he then goes into the small plates. Yeah, which seem to have been appended from, there. Yep. So goes from Moroni to first Nephi. And then translates. So Words of Mormon is the last thing that Joseph Smith will translate on the gold plates before the Book yeah. of Mormon is published. Yep. Um, and so, but then there's this. And this is another reason why I really like the idea that Mormon's having this shift in the way that his record appears. Because in verse 7, he says, I do this for a wise purpose. For thus it whispereth me, according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord, which is in me. That sounds a lot like Nephi when he's saying, I'm making these small plates, but I don't know why. Yep. It, both of them seem to have been moved to do this, not knowing why. I mean, uh, this is so touching to me. God was whispering to Nephi in 600 BC and to Mormon in 400, well, 300 and something AD, um, close to 400 AD, uh, long before 1829. Uh, when Joseph Smith is having a need for these small plates, God had already provided the answer. It makes me wonder how many things in my life God provided the answer for a long time ago, and uh, he, he's just looking out for us in that way. Yeah, and so, and, and again, if the 116 pages read differently, more like history rather than inter, uh, connected with these prophecies, it's almost like God is giving Mormon an opportunity to practice a bridging before the part that we're actually going to have. And Joseph Smith is given a practice, uh, an opportunity to practice translating before translating the part of the book of Mormon that's actually going to be needed. Oh, that's powerful. Um, and so, so God is training his children. Uh, and we see it in, in the way in which this record is coming about. Uh, if I can be personal for a minute, Carrie, I, I when I think of this, I think of President Thomas S. Monson's experience as a bishop and sitting in a stake leadership meeting while the state president is speaking. And he has the impression to go visit one of his ward members in the Veterans Hospital in Salt Lake City. Yeah. And and uh, many of our listeners are probably familiar with this story. But um, President Monson doesn't listen because he thinks it would be rude to get up in the middle of this the, the stake president's remarks and leave and so he waits and then eventually gets to the the hospital and finds that the individual that he was impressed to go visit had passed away yeah um and and president monson at his funeral one of the things that was said was the recounting of this story and that president monson had that story at the forefront of his mind for the rest of his life to never put off an impression yeah um and, and I think that that's instructive for us. I know it's been instructive in my life uh, because um, I knew that story. I had read that story and um, we had a, a state conference in which Elder Suarez, right? But it was in March, right before Elder Suarez was called to be a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Uh, but he was a 70 at the time and he was, he was teaching. And I was sitting front and center, or right in the middle of the congregation, and in the middle of his talk, I had an impression to get up and go visit a family that I ministered to. Um, and my first impression was, I can't get up. This member of the 70 is speaking. I can't, I can't get up in the middle of the talk. Everybody will see me, and it will be hugely distracting. And the very next impression that came to my mind was, remember President Monson. Wow. And... Um, and so I stood up in the middle of Elder Suarez's talk and I walked out of the meeting. I got in my car. My wife and I, we had um, three children at the time. And so the way we were going to work state conferences, I went to the priesthood leadership meeting and she was going to go to the evening session. Uh, many of your listeners have probably done something similar with children and, and yeah. babysitting. Uh, um, and so I left and I went straight to the ministering family's home. Um, and to to not go into too much detail, but um, there, uh, as I approached the door, I could hear that some things were going on between the couple. And, uh, it was one of those times where I wanted to say, I'm not going to get in the middle of this. Like, this isn't my place. Um, but I, again, I felt that prompting and I knocked on the door. Uh, it was a little awkward when the husband answered and I said, I don't know why I'm here, but I just feel impressed to let you know that elder Suarez of the 70 is speaking in an, 
in just a few minutes in our stake center. And I think it would be wonderful if you would come. And the, the husband looked at me and just kind of quizzically said, oh, all right, and shut the door. Um, because of the time lap, there wasn't a lot. And I hurried home. I uh, gave the keys to my wife and my wife drove to the state conference. Uh, and uh, I stayed with the children. And that night she came back and she goes, Josh, I just want you to know that I had the opportunity to sit behind the couple that you minister to. Hmm. And in the middle of Elder Suarez's talk, I saw the husband put his arm around the wife and give her a kiss on the head. And my wife's response at this moment, she said, Josh, in that moment, I, I wish you had been there because I wanted you to be next to me as he was talking about marriage and family. And my wife didn't know anything about the experience that I had had. And yet God allowed me to see a little bit of how he used me as an instrument to, to, to maybe help a couple in a time of need. Um, and, and so I, I know we're talking about the scriptures, but this is just how real they are to me is when I see that whispering, I just, I have a determination in my life to want to listen to every prompting that I get. And even Amen. if it doesn't make sense, even if it, it, it seems to be counterintuitive to logic and reason, um, God has a purpose. And, and, and that's where I'll end with Mormon's words. He says in verse seven, I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore he worketh in me to do according to his will. And my hope is, is that I can be that kind of instrument throughout my life. Wow, that's a, a powerful story and a powerful uh, reminder for us, Josh, how important this is. Uh, wow. I mean, we, we talked about promptings and revelation and seeking communion with God, but then to, to share a story like that uh, highlights how desperate we are when we don't even know we're desperate and how desperate others are that we be desperate and be in tune. So th thank you for sharing that story. Um, and, and I hope this doesn't uh, take away. If I were wise, I'd probably just let us end on that. But I also want to say, as I'm continuing to read, I'm more convinced that, uh, that you're correct. I, I just want to go down to verse nine, where it says, I Mormon proceed to finish out my record, which I take from the plates of Nephi. So that makes it pretty clear. He has a bit more uh, and, and, uh, when he may have just been thinking, he was the first one where he says he's about to give him to Moroni. He may not know how much longer he has left. And he actually ends up with a lot of time left and he writes a lot more, but, but to your point, I want to read the next part of verse nine after he says, he's going to proceed to finish his record. And I make it according to the knowledge and the understanding, which God has given me, which I do think is very likely a new knowledge and understanding that he's derived from reading through these small plates. Um, and and maybe that's a good way for us to end our reading of the small plates and prepare for what will be Mormon's abridgment of the large plates. This is a, an essential shift in the Book of Mormon. It's a pretty pretty real change as we now get to Mormon's uh, abridgment. Before this, this words of Mormon is the first time we've read Mormon so far, uh, but we're going to read him from here on out. Um, and uh, I hope that we can can like Mormon say okay. These things, these these uh, testimonies of Christ and and teaching of the covenant uh, and and so on that have been the focus of Nephi and Jacob, they will be the 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 lenses that we should apply as we read the rest of the plates. And I'm going to change also because I, I usually say uh, Christ and covenant. But uh, from Noel Reynolds, uh, who was our first one in, in, uh, in two different episodes, he taught me this, and then you've taught me this this time, uh, I think we need to add, and actually uh, it became a focus as we did 2 Nephi 31 as well, we need to add having continual revelation and choosing to follow that revelation. That has been a theme that we've seen de uh, developed again and again and again over these small plates, and you've just illustrated it for us so powerfully, and so I hope that that's a lens that we'll put on as well as we read the rest of the Book of Mormon that we can learn from Nephi and Jacob and Mormon and Josh Matson uh, ab about those things. So thank you for sharing with us, Josh. Thanks for having me, Carrie. That was that was really powerful. I'm very very uh, motivated and touched by by your story. Um, I also want to encourage uh, our audience uh, to act learn from Josh and act on promptings and go and do the things the Lord uh, prompts you to do. 
And I would guess that uh, you've been acted or prompted uh, during this to do something different in your own life and maybe some things that you should share with some other people. And we would encourage you to go and share and edify and uplift other people. We'd also love for you to share the podcast either by word of mouth or social media or likes and downloads and reviews and rates and everything else. And we'll also encourage you to tune in with us next week as we start um, uh, Mosiah uh, and we start to get into the powerful teachings of King Benjamin. Andrew Skinner is going to be our guest. He's always a, a fan favorite on the podcast. So uh, we'd invite everyone to come and tell their their neighbors to listen to that one. Uh, and uh, But most of all, we'd invite you to listen to the promptings of the Spirit as they testify of Christ and tell you how to serve him as Josh has so ably taught us. So thank you again, Josh. Thank you.